Welcome back to panel session three now of FIMAC day two, where we'll be discussing elements of an effective portfolio beyond diversification. Please allow me to welcome our esteemed panelists. We have in person Gerald Ambrose, Chief Executive Officer of Aberdeen Islamic Malaysia, as well as Dr. Tan Chong Kui, Founder and Chief Strategist of FIM Asset Management Syndrome Brahad, who's flown in from Singapore this morning just to be here in person. So I, I, I like that old schoolness, <laughs> that dedication. <laughs> Um, also, joining us virtually, we have YS Chong, who is Head of Financial Planning and Institutional Support Department of Public Mutual, who is dialing in from Singapore. Um, interesting that. There's a little swap room. A little background on our panelists today. Uh, formerly a British Royal Navy officer, um, way back in the day, uh, Jerry is the CEO now of Aberdeen Islamic Malaysia Syndrome Burhad, the group's Islamic fund management hub. He joined Aberdeen Malaysia in 2005 after the company was selected to be the first licensed foreign owned fund manager under the government's then special scheme. Uh, previously, Gerald was an institutional sales director covering ASEAN equities at Kim Eng Securities in Singapore, HSBC James Cavill in London, and BNP Paribas Securities London, uh, which actually was what sent him uh, to our shores in, uh, in, <laughs> in 1990. No, no, actually after. Yes, yes, after I was born. Um. <laughs> Jerry, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Tan uh, Chung Kui uh, founded uh, Fame Asset Management uh, Syndrome Brahad, Malaysia, as well as Fame Asset Management Asia Private Limited in Singapore in 1994 and 1995, respectively, after successfully helping others to build their own fund management businesses for about 18 years. His original... Um, uh, 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 you were helping them before to, to help uh, build... Yeah, fund management businesses for 18 years. Um, his original innovative and proven investment philosophy, which he's known for, which is never fully invest at all times, has made significant contributions to the fund management industry regionally as well as internationally after weathering through the difficult and volatile Asian markets um, over, his, uh, over his last 45 career span since starting in 1976. So we, we are with... Um, uh, a wealth of experience here, um, and, a, and it's very distinguished panel, and I'm very honored that we, we have these um, two guests as well as um, uh, 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 our guest in, in Singapore. So, Dr. Tan's outstanding and consistent long-term track record and his willingness to share his knowledge, research, and experience are plausible in terms of value added to the fund management industry as well as society. Um, if you want to look him up some more, he's won plenty of awards um, and accolades. Uh, you, you, you can look that up online. Now, joining us from Singapore, we have YS Chong, who is a chartered financial consultant as well as a certified financial planner. He's also the head of the financial planning and institutional support department of Public Mutual Brahad. He's been involved in many uh, financial planning services, uh, activities, events that have led actually to the establishment of uh, FP practices in Malaysia. He's had over more than 28 years of experience at Public Mutual, um, and in his time uh, with FP practices, he's rolled out numerous projects that have made an impact in the FP field, including several softwares to help people plan their finances, um, as well as advisory software for unit trust consultants. He heads up the digital innovation department for Public Mutual, uh, this was since 2020, and is a strong believer in anything that's transformational and that can be digitalized to bring more convenience and benefit to investors. So welcome, gentlemen, to our panel of the day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, today we'll explore beyond what we usually hear, which is to diversify your portfolio. It's, it's common advice, um, but how much, we're wondering how much is too much and is merely diversifying enough in these volatile times that we're in? It's, it's quite strange times. Um, so uh, may, maybe uh, I can touch on that first, uh, perhaps. Uh, Gerald, would you like to start? Uh, certainly, Anita. Yeah, I sort of had a think about this and I've prepared a couple of uh, slides 
uh, and uh, Shasha has very kindly given me a bit of kit that uh, uh, will enable me, I hope, to uh, move it. So I'll just start with a quote from a, a Scotsman who lived in the 18th century, a chap called Adam Smith, who wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. Um, he uh, never married, lived with his mother, and uh, was a very uh, a deep thinker. But uh, he's basically highlighting here how Dr. Tan, uh, uh, YS, and myself, we manage other people's money. And with that comes uh, some risks and extra responsibility, which is why we're so tightly regulated. But he basically said, for people like us, uh, fund managers, uh, the directors of such companies, being the managers rather of other people's money rather than their own, it can't well be expected that they should watch over it with the same anxious vigilance with which they would watch over their own. Negligence and profusion, therefore, must always prevail, more or less, in the management of the affairs of such a company. So basically, if we weren't told what to do and you're managing somebody else's money, you might think, oh, well, look, um, why don't we put all their money on uh, uh, Sports Toto? And, uh, you know, they could win a hell of a lot. But on the other hand, it could go to zero. So uh, that's the one of the sort of key things that we have a great responsibility for managing other people's money. Um, some other thoughts that I uh, uh, put down here were uh, that each client, whether an individual or uh, whether you're managing your own money, you've got to be very clear about your objectives. And as a fund manager for other clients, uh, we have to be absolutely clear about what they want from the money. You know, do they want it to double in a week? In which case, we'd probably be the wrong fund manager for them. Uh, I'd like to think we're the right fund manager to avoid halving it in a week. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's two main objectives, I suppose. That's capital growth uh, and income, uh, or a combination of the two. Um, and you have to know what your risk appetite is. And that is really a result of your objective is for somebody's retirement. Of course, the risk appetite is, is, is very low. Uh, and when do you want the fund maybe to close or the, the fruition of that fund? Uh, and the restrictions, you know, each fund manager, sorry, each client might have uh, uh, a certain ethical requirements or, or is religious requirements or a combination of or now uh, more awareness of uh, climate change and sustainability. These are all factors that have to be taken into account and affect how you build the portfolio. Um, once you've done that, I think uh, it's very important uh, to avoid getting a bit cavalier with other people's money is to have a sort of another party, uh, independent oversight to make sure that you're not uh, uh, playing too fast and loose or, or your, your, your process doesn't have problems. Um, and for me, I suppose, you know, uh, never fall in love. That's a generalization. You know, I, I don't mean in, in, in life, never fall in love. Uh, but uh, if you fall in love with a stock, uh, stocks can be fickle mistresses, uh, and uh, you have to be very careful that uh, uh, you, you don't follow a stock down and keep believing in them when uh, obviously they're not doing what they, you thought they might do. Uh, and I suppose that's combined with uh, uh, learn how to sell. Um, uh, don't take a holiday. Uh, actually, I don't know. A lot of people do sell in May and go away. Uh, that might be uh, uh, vary according to, to people and according to the objectives. And the other point that I've written down here that I don't, didn't put in this slide is uh, have a process. You must have a system. Unless you depend on one star fund manager who isn't going to live forever, uh, to have a commonly accepted process, a, a style as it were, uh, I think is very important so that everybody who joins the team uh, 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 realizes that that's the way it's done. And as particularly for a large multinational fund manager like Aberdeen, uh, we had to have people in Philadelphia, Sao Paulo, uh, 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 London, uh, Kuala Lumpur, who, who will be approaching uh, the way they look at stocks in exactly the same way. So, so we have a style uh, and we don't depend on stars. It's more of a conceptual thing. Um, I'm realize I might be waffling on a little bit. I don't know if I've got time to say more, but the other thing I think people need to realize is that uh, the concept of capital markets as uh, uh, something for social good. The reasons why we have capital markets is that in the world there are a lot of people with a lot of money probably coming towards the end of their lives but don't really know how to make it grow. Uh, and there's maybe an even larger amount of people who are just starting out on their careers that uh, have great ideas and understand how the world works or how the community might work, and they want people to invest 
they need money to invest in their project. So the whole idea of a capital markets from the beginning of time was to transfer the funds from uh, those who have wealth and need income uh, to those who have ideas and can provide that income. And the result for society is that you have extra services. Society improves because good things are being funded. And the way markets work is that if you invest in something that doesn't work, or you don't think it's going to work, you take your money away. And those things that do work, you put money in. And that means prices go up and down. So imagining that we don't have any government intervention, which is a, a long stretch at the moment, uh, that's the concept upon which capital markets live. It's not really about being able to double your money in a week. That's really, you're probably better up in Genting Highlands or Sports Toto or whatever <laughs> to do that. Um, what else have I got to say here? Do you, uh, think, do you think we could come back to that in, in, in a little while? Most certainly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will you. shut up. <laughs> no, not at all. No, we love, we love the input, Jerry. We've just got a few, a few questions to go through, and, uh, and, and you've touched on a few of these questions already. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have a, 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 a bit sure. of, of, of uh, word in from um, Dr. Tan. Uh, Dr. Tan, what's, what's your take on um, uh, going beyond diversifying the portfolio and... and and uh, especially in these times? Yeah, okay, maybe I should go to some basics. Right? Suppose you have money, what do you do? You can put your money in the saving account, you can put your money in the bonds, you can put some money in real estate, you can put some money in the stock market, you can also buy some gold. Now the new trend, you can buy some Bitcoin. But the key is that you need to know like what uh, Ambrose was saying that you need to know the risk you are taking. Now, if you don't know the risk you are taking, the best is going to talk to some people who know better in investment. Yeah, of course, we, sorry to say that, no? we have vested interest. You can go and see some good fund manager who can guide you along. Oh, so many uh, financial planners around now. Yeah. So uh, the situation now is that a lot of people, especially those who come today, they are very much wanted to talk about how to grow their money. Yeah, the, the key is that you must know the risk. That's why, unfortunately, uh, you must know how to uh, manage the inherent risk of each instrument. Yeah, for example, if you, you put all your money in one company, as you can see, in 2020, what happened to the rubber glove? You know, you lose a lot of money by not diversifying, you know. So uh, we, 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 we have, I have managed fund, or I've been in, a, in a, this field for more than 45 years now. I've gone through so many crises. I've gone through Asian crises. I've gone through tax bubble. I've gone through uh, 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 September 11, SA, global financial crisis. The most important one was the COVID, you know. Do I? Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I, I hope you all can hear what I say, but you can turn up your, your, turn, turn up your volume. Now I, I hope I can do better now. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, the key is to find out the risk, uh, not just going after the maximum return. But you know, like for example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, many people make money, make good money, but also very volatile. You know, Bitcoin break more than 60,000 and also go below 20,000. So share is also the same. Recently, you take a look at the share. Yeah, the, they, were, they were making some, uh, some, uh, some statement that, you know, shares are even more volatile than Bitcoin at some point. But of course, you know, at, at another point, you know, there are so many, so many shares that has done well and no, people overlook and it is so undervalued you can make money. But I think everyone, most people, the key is how to make more money than your fixed deposit by taking very low risk, how to make more money than the inflation. That's the key. And uh, I think that should be your basic. And then if you're not so, uh, not too demanding, sometimes when you're too demanding, people tell you, but you are actually taking very high risk. Uh, the key is that, you know, uh, when the market is very high, instead of buying, instead of saying that you will do much better, sometimes you may want to do the other way. I think I should stop here yeah. for a while. Yes, right? yes, yes. I was going to say, Dr. Yeah. Tan. Um, I would encourage people to ask questions because I, 
I always not like the way that I keep on telling you what I want. I want you to hear me. Yes. It's better that you ask questions. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. So, I mean, we're going to go into the details of exactly what you said. I, I like those principles that you mentioned. Um, yeah, everyone wants to make money at low risks, uh, especially in these times. Um, and, and you want to know how to beat inflation, how to make your money work for you. Um, so, can we move on to, to, to YS and, and let's hear your thoughts. Uh, it seems as if um, uh, technology and digitalization um, seems to be your forte as well. So, YS, why don't you tell us uh, what it means to you to diversif to go beyond diversification um, in terms of securing a good portfolio? Good morning, Anita, and to my fellow panelists. Um, thank you for having me here. Well, um, I can't agree more that uh, having a diversified portfolio is uh, important. I think in uh, today's uh, time and age, um, with the help of uh, digital tools, especially these uh, software apps, it will help a lot uh, in uh, providing the best of uh, services to our customers. Now, uh, as you are aware, in Public Mutual, uh, we actually um, work together with our agents. So they are the providers of our services. So um, basically, with the help of uh, these uh, tools, uh, they are able to do their work better and uh, at the same time, able to deliver um, quality uh, advice. And also, um, um, I would say that uh, they probably need more uh, factors to help them to achieve more, uh, uh, what they call these uh, uh, plans about that they have in mind. But when it comes to investing, constructing a suitable portfolio is a very important uh, aspect to keep in mind. So a portfolio is important because it will have the right mix of investment, which will give you an acceptable risk return trade off, while able to meet your investment objective and appropriate to your risk appetite. Um, however, before we could structure an effective uh, portfolio, you will really need to consider the following factors, right? Um, point number one is your investment objective. That's very important. Uh, we need to understand um, what will be the purpose of that uh, investment for, that portfolio that you have created. Is it to preserve capital? Is it to maximize growth? Or is it to achieve some form of income with some uh, capital growth in mind. Uh, this will be a very important uh, factor for us to understand so that uh, we are able to customize products that are suitable to this kind of uh, investment objective. Okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah, the second part I, will, I would like to uh, highlight is current age. Your current age basically is also a very important factor that we look at, especially when we look at um, the stages of life. Uh, we need to understand whether this person belongs to the uh, young adulthood or perhaps at uh, another uh, age uh, stage where it's retirement. So with that in mind, we are able to uh, understand um, what kind of uh, products and services will be uh, suitable for this group of people. For instance, I take one example. If you are at the age of 30 and below, you are basically in the uh, young adulthood stage. So for people like this uh, nature, maybe they are able to take on more risk. Therefore, we will probably uh, be able to uh, customize a product which has higher risk, uh, uh, what I call this, uh, uh, higher risk, yeah. So in that sense, we we are able to fulfill the needs if there is a, such a uh, needs arise. Whereas if we were to compare with another person at the uh, age of sixty, perhaps the uh, investor here is more risk averse, right? Therefore, there is a need for us to understand uh, risk at this level, at this age. Maybe we customize some kind of uh, 
products that will be at a lower risk, uh, where it still meet their uh, objectives. So other areas that I'd like to uh, also uh, emphasize is this uh, education background. Now, education is very important to understand investment products and services and its associated uh, risks. Um, a good grasp of the uh, idea about investment and its risk will give you a very good uh, understanding on what kind of products or services that uh, one has purchased or invested. Uh, compared to the, another person who has no or very little knowledge or education, perhaps this could be another uh, uh, struggle when it comes to uh, understanding uh, the portfolio that uh, they have created. Other areas that I think uh, we also need to understand is the uh, level of knowledge and experience. Now, this area is also we've got to do with the managing of risk. If a person has already um, been exposed to some form of investment, especially related to equity, perhaps uh, they are able to manage their risk better yep, and uh, to understand the product better. Yep. Uh, and the last one, I felt the uh, importance of having to understand your resources. Now, resources to me, it's a source of funding for your uh, portfolio. Where is it coming from? Are you of a high net worth individual? Or you have extra funds, right? from your monthly or yearly cash flow that you can set aside for investment. Now, people like this nature, maybe they are able to take on more risk. Yeah? And um, I think uh, that's a very important uh, area as, aspect as well that uh, one has to consider uh, whenever we create uh, or before we create a portfolio. All right. So uh, basically, all these uh, processes and all these uh, factors that I mentioned just now, um, I will say that uh, one has to have a very good understanding. And uh, with that, I believe uh, then only we are able to suggest a proper asset allocation. I think those are brilliant factors, uh, Wyas. Thank you for outlining it such. I think you were echoing some that Jerry had mentioned earlier as well. Um, we're, we're hearing uh, some some common factors that are that need to be taken into consideration. Um, Jerry, I saw you taking some notes on on, on some points. Um, <laughs> would you like to expand on that? Yeah, my notes are um, potatoes, milk. No, oh, sorry, that's my uh, grocery uh, list. <laughs> oh, no, don't but, mind uh, me. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I agree with uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Tan and uh, YS has said, and uh, I, I would point out that, say, Aberdeen, we, we now have three what we call vectors as a group uh, in investment, and that is uh, investments itself, uh, private investments to cater for people who are their own CIOs or individual investments, uh, and then independent financial advisors in, in, in the UK uh, and the rest of the Western world, really. People's responsibility for their retirement is increasingly on their heads. So, uh, and the importance of software, as Waya said, and being able to find out from the client through software, and I think they call it gamification, is very important to, to find out uh, you know, what sort of portfolio they should have for their uh, retirement. Uh, but here in Malaysia, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, the old Aberdeen style, which is active fund managing, really. And I think it's very similar to, to Dr. Tan. And that is that um, uh, we want to find out about companies. We invest a huge amount of people, uh, amount of money, uh, and destroy our profit margins by employing people to go and visit companies regularly and find out uh, uh, the quality uh, of those companies, uh, whether they have a competitive advantage, uh, whether they have a balance sheet that can fund their growth and free cash flow to pay out dividends, uh, and most importantly, whether the management's honest, uh, and that uh, if, if their governance is good, and they've assessed the uh, sustainability risks of their company going forward, that, that's the quality criterion. Uh, and then the other criterion we have, which is valuation. You have to be able to work out what a share, in your view, is worth. Uh, and if 
The market is a fickle beast, as I said before. Uh, it's trading significantly below what you think it's worth, and it is a company of high quality. That's when we would buy it. Uh, uh, and then on, there are occasions when equities get ridiculously overvalued. Uh, we've seen that this year, particularly at the beginning of this year, and it happened at the dot-com uh, uh, bubble in 2000, and of course in 2007 as well. Uh, uh, things get overvalued, and you, we, we sell on that basis. And it doesn't work every time. But I think uh, a few th points I want to make about portfolio management, really, and that is, uh, most importantly, uh, the first priority for us, because we manage a lot of pension funds, uh, is the preservation of capital. Okay, and, and there's a risk and return in every individual stock picking decision. Uh, and, and they're seen as two different beasts. But in our view, uh, if we look at a company that will see long-term growth, uh, uh, the re those companies that we see as conservative and low risk actually happen in the long run to have the best return because they have a, have a moat uh, and they can perform better than others. Um, that's the point I wanted to make uh, uh, there. Uh, so we, we work basically on stock picking on quality and value. Uh, and that's how our portfolio uh, starts to be formed. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, so did you have more to add to that? No, not really. Other than, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we then, uh, as, uh, as YS has mentioned and as uh, Dr. Tan has mentioned, uh, each client might have a slightly different objective. So we will then adjust. We have a list of stocks that we can buy. This is on, on equity investment. But we might adjust the mix of that stock, of that portfolio, according to what the client's objective is. Uh, and sometimes there are religious uh, constraints as well and others. So uh, this is the basis upon which we, we base our portfolio, client protection uh, and making sure they don't lose money. Because when you lose money, it's, that's when a portfolio underperforms for the long term. If you make some awful investments that buy something that is ridiculously overvalued, it's very hard to recover from. Yeah. Um, I uh, w definitely sound advice there. Um, <laughs> uh, we're talking a lot about, um, about um, securities as an asset class. Um, I have a question here about... Um, I have a question here about how in the past we usually recommend a mix of equities, uh, bonds, to have so-called a safer portfolio. Um, but there are times recently where both bonds and equities went down at the same time. And what are your views on that? You know, in terms of when that happens, what would you consider a more secure or diversified portfolio? Uh, well, uh, I was just getting to... Can we get my slides back? There was a, a ridiculously busy slide looking at that one there. You, you probably can't read it, but uh, all those different colours there uh, are uh, different uh, strategies in equity investment. And over the past 10 years, the, from left to right is the order of how well they've done that year. And they're all over the place. Uh, you know, if you were uh, uh, big into growth stocks, it's been fantastic for two or three years, but this year has been an absolute disaster. And as I said before, the aim is to avoid uh, 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 heavy losses. Yeah. That's our key thing. And uh, just for an example, if you look at the white uh, 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 boxes the end. in there, yeah. uh, that's global equities, the most general uh, of them. And uh, they've not come first in any particular year. Uh, neither have they come last. Uh, and uh, uh, as I was mentioning to Dennis earlier, you know, uh, the aim is really, you don't want to shoot the lights out every year. It's just not possible. You want to maybe get to the second or third step of the kitchen ladder uh, and avoid uh, Falling high when risk, down. but <laughs> also beat, beat the market. So uh, uh, global equities in this example would show that uh, they tend to outperform generally. But this year has been the most awful year for equities. Uh, and at the same time, it's been awful for fixed income. And a lot of people have always said, and it's worked for the past 15 years, or maybe longer, that uh, having an equity that's 60% equities, sorry, having a portfolio that is 60% equities, 40% uh, government bonds, say, uh, means that if you have a fall in the equity side, you get some sort of offsetting gain in the uh, fixed income side. Uh, and that has fallen flat on its face this year. You know, in fact, everything has fallen flat on its face, really, apart from 
the US dollar. So, you know, yeah. maybe, you know, uh, putting your money under the mattress uh, might have been the right thing to do so far this year if you kept them in US dollars. Even gold, even, of course, Bitcoin's at a terrible time. So th these are really tricky times, and we believe that diversification helps you avoid. You don't soar with the eagles, but you don't sort of lie down there on the ground with the, with the voles as well. Yeah, you, you've touched on that. Actually, there's a question there, but uh, I think, uh, Dr. Tan, you have something to say on that matter. Okay, I, I think it's a very good question. Yeah, we have been enjoying lower interest rate, and uh, your share has gone up. Your bond also has performed. Now, what happened now? The interest rate is going up. Uh, you know, the inflation also coming in. This is the first time for a long time when the interest rate go up, your bond is not going to perform unless you only concentrate on bond that has a very uh, low tenant. So, but, you know, uh, many of them, if they have bonds that has a long years to maturity, they most probably will suffer. Yeah, which is the case now. You have a higher interest rate, your bond side is not performing. Your higher interest rate also eventually also hurt the equity. Now, this is the time when your equity was hurt and your bonds also was hurt. Unless you are very conservative, you only buy bonds that has very short period, maybe three year, two year, one year and below. So that's why if you look at us, I've, I've been in the same line for more than 45 years now. I've gone through many, many crises. That's why you notice that our philosophy, which I developed and feel very proud, that we never have to fully invest at all times. That means when you are facing, you are coming into this situation, you want to have more cash. You want to have more cash because no matter how you run, you still will get hurt. The guy who has more cash now will benefit because they will not get hurt by the bonds. They will also not get hurt by the, by the equity. Now, why are you keeping cash now? You are keeping cash not because cash is such a great thing. You are keeping cash because you read that the market is going to come down. Now, when the market comes down, you are the only few who get hurt less and who got the money to buy cheap shares. Take a look at 2020. 2020, whoever sell at the beginning of the year, they would have cash to buy back. Some houses did very well in 2020. That's the key. Sorry, I hope I have answered this question. It's so, investment can, be, can make it simple, can also make it very complicated. That's why I always advise that the best is that you go and be friend with someone who is very good in fund management. <laughs> it's interesting because the both of you so far have basically said, you know, keep the cash. You know, uh, keep the cash at the moment. It, it's, it, seems, it seems to be, to be a safer strategy. Well, uh, Anita, th there is a risk in that as well. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, Aberdeen has a very different philosophy generally to uh, that of uh, Dr. Tan's there and that, uh, you know, our overall belief is for a long-term growth objective, uh, if a client gives you money, you remain fully invested. If, if, if you keep cash, you may as well give it back to them. Um, now, there are a number of mandates and clients that we have here in Malaysia that need income regularly, and this requires you to realize gains on stocks as well as take dividends. Uh, and it's very important to be more agile for that type of client. Uh, and we have uh, forsaken that rule of remaining, you know, 2% maximum in cash, uh, and we have more cash. Uh, but the risk is, of course, if you're very heavily in cash and you call the market wrong, uh, and you stay in cash when the market goes on a, uh, a, a super run, uh, you will in inevitably underperform. So uh, there are risks everywhere. In fact, the more I look at it, the more I wonder why I'm doing this job. <laughs> okay, we've got some questions here. So, uh, YS, did you want to chime in on that question? Um, yeah, I have some uh, thought about this. Um, I think um, having uh, cash is also a strategy, especially in times like this. Yeah. So from the financial planning perspective, in fact, this is the best time for us to review our portfolio. Right? We would like to check whether our portfolio still meet our investment goals and objectives, whether it still suits us or not. Yeah. So especially on the risk appetite. Yeah. So with changes uh, like now, I think it's a high time for us to review 
our portfolio. In fact, this is the opportune time yeah, to uh, accumulate some funds, especially those that have already been uh, you know, uh, knocked down uh, heavily. And uh, maybe this is the uh, most opportune time in the sense that uh, you are able to create uh, at the portfolio. Uh, you are able to reshuffle your portfolio. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, you may want to uh, practice some form of dollar cost averaging yeah, for some of the funds that you have invested in. Yep. And at the same time, also uh, remember uh, to uh, apply the uh, power of compounding yeah, when you still have the time with you. Yeah. And these are the, uh, what I say, the strategies that you can apply uh, on top of that. Maybe if you're still very hesitant to invest, perhaps the other way is to break your investment into several tranches yeah, over a period of time. And that probably will also help to reduce the uh, acquisition costs. And that will also, in a way, uh, reduce the uh, risk uh, associated with the uh, products or funds that you intend to invest. So uh, that's my view about this. Those are brilliant strategies as well, uh, YS. Um, so I, I, I see you smiling away. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify one thing because I think our ambrosia is very sharp. You know? when, you, when I say to keep cash, I mean that you keep your cash, you actually you invested your cash in the so-called uh, bonds or, 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 or instrument that has shorter term so that when the interest rate continue to go up, you still earn your interest. That cash is not something that you don't earn at all. But of course, eventually, whether you outperform or underperform, it depends on how well you read the major trend. So, but as an equity fund manager, sometimes you also do, at some point, take a bit of extra risk, saying that, like, for example, let me, I hope I have a few minutes, huh? Just to explain, I'm an equity fund manager, and I take risks. Huh? Uh, equity is my main factor. I'm not a Bitcoin specialist. I'm not a gold specialist. I'm also not a property specialist, but I'm an equity fund manager. Just to give you some, some of my view. Do you know that Dow Jones hit the highest point on January the 4th this year? And what do you do? Are you going to reduce your equity or are you going to stay put? And it was 24.5% higher than the highest point in 2020 when the market crashed. And the market crashed for 38.4% within five and a half weeks. Even today, Dow Jones is higher than the highest point in 2020. You make your own decision. Uh, a lot of people will ask you this question. Are you going to buy share now or are you going to wait? Now, I'm telling you that Dow Jones yesterday, or you see today, is higher than the highest point in 2020, the time when the market crashed. And the market went down for 38.4% within five and a half weeks. Interesting, huh? Yeah, how do you handle your volatility? Now, the key as a fund manager, equity fund manager, is how do you outperform in the long run? If you don't outperform, you're done already. Many fund managers cannot tahan, you know. Uh, sorry, I, I think I should stop here. <laughs> I'm just trying to, trying to express. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I'm an equity fund manager. I may not be able to advise you in everything. Just the same as you know, many people make money in equity, but other people who only get excited when the market goes up. But you, you take a look at your long term. If you buy equity when the market is bad, in the long run, you will make good money. Make good money in the sense that you will beat the fixed deposit and also you will beat the inflation. But I put the other way around. People say equity will do well and all these things. If you put your money when the market is the highest point, if you put your money in a sector 
and you know what happened to 2020, which sector that totally collapsed, 90 over percent disappeared. You, <laughs> so fund manager, like I say, you know, it can be, you can make it simple, but you can make it also very complicated. But it's not that simple and it's not that complicated. Either. I guess that's what you mean, Dr. Tani. Thank you very much. It's in Thanks. terms of looking at the long-term goals, right? Uh, it, what, are you, what are you looking for? Uh, what, you, what are your goals? Over what horizon are you looking at? If you buy at the highest point, your long term is also no. Longer. It's also to, yeah. to pots. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like I say, you can be, you can make simpler and you can make complicated, but you must know. So, what we always say is that your research, your experience, your wisdom will help you to outperform. Right. So it's not just about what asset classes at this point. It's talking about timing and trends as well as that. Uh, Jerry, would you like to chime in on that? Well, yeah, we've had, I think, two major trends over the past sort of 30 years in equity investment, in investment generally. Uh, and that is uh, uh, both Dr. Tan and I are what you call active equity investors. Uh, and that means we, we like to know the fundamentals of the uh, companies and we do stock picking, uh, irrespective of the, the, the index. Or we're aware of the, what the index is and the mix of stocks in the index, but uh, we don't have to follow it. Uh, but uh, the growing trend, really, since uh, uh, I'm about to say before you were born again, but I, 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 is since the 90s or maybe the late 80s, is passive investing, exchange-traded funds, in which a fund will invest in exactly the combination of shares that an index, like the SP, S&P 500 indexes or the MSCI All Countries World indexes, and you don't wander from that. So you're never going to underperform the index. Uh, and because it's all done by computers, and computers don't have to be paid every month, uh, it's y y the computer-generated exchange-traded funds and passive investing generally can charge much lower fees, uh, as low as you know five to ten basis points. Uh, whereas uh, uh, what Dr. Tan and I do involves people wearing out their shoes, visiting companies, finding out uh, how companies work, debating upon uh, whether the business model they have will grow and the honesty of the management, etc. That means that we have to charge a fee for those people to do it. And I think for the past 20 years, at least, uh, uh, the passive investing ETFs have won. Uh, because uh, I think over the longer term, a lot of active fund managers, maybe a majority of them, have underperformed the index. Uh, but the whole thing is rather self-fulfilling, and that is that uh, if you, uh, an index is formed of companies that are judged by their size, their liquidity, and the amount of stock company shares in the public float. The computers will just calculate what they should buy in those big companies. But size, liquidity, and public float are nothing to do with uh, honesty, quality, good management, and valuation. So valuations have lost touch with uh, 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 the, the performance of an index. And I think we are now coming back to a stage when, as Dr. Tan says, in order to outperform, you have to be able to pick those, you know, sort the wheat from the chaff and pick out the good quality stocks, which is what we do. And maybe, uh, uh, I'm only 21, so I've got a, a, a lot of future in front of me. Maybe this is the, the renaissance of active fund management because it, because it works. Yeah, I, I see the value in that. Uh, that's exactly what the wealth of experience and having harbored through all these different financial crises over the years, that's what it's offered you, this experience and this knowledge. Um, what people are really wondering at this point is, okay, if it's time to reassess and to recalibrate the portfolio, um, what would you say are the safest things to look at right now? What are the safest asset classes to look at right now, uh, considering that things are volatile and people are now looking to rebalance their portfolios? Um, and if they are looking to rebalance those portfolios, what, what, do, those, what do the ratios look like? Ideally? Can I chip in again, just briefly, uh, uh, to say that uh, we are at a particularly uncertain time. Uh, if anybody tells you he or she is absolutely sure they know what's going to happen when the Federal Reserve will pivot, uh, when... Uh, President Putin decides, oh, God, I've made a mess of this. Let's, let's give up. I'll negotiate. You know, wh what will happen in uh, uh, UK or global politics? Uh, I think you, you want to be very wary of that person. So diversification more than ever is key because, you know, we've had a tremendous hit this year uh, from uh, uh, huge falls in a lot of these tech stocks, which were very expensive, but they were growing. 
growth was at a premium in these low interest rate world. Now, I think that may continue. You know, some of these stocks, uh, uh, some of these companies make the world a better place uh, and, and they will come back uh, uh, in value. So I don't want to really boot anything out. Uh, uh, and it appears from even what, uh, 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 is it Tansri Adik, Awang Adik? Uh, the uh, uh, head of uh, the new, new chairman of the Securities Commission was saying today is that uh, people are looking at more alternatives, not just equities, but uh, there are private markets, uh, real estate, quantitative funds, uh, a huge variety of things from uh, gold to uh, Bitcoin to foreign exchange movements, etc. So I think we're finding our clients moving more to greater diversification, not just geographically, but also by asset class. Uh, and there are a number of uh, mutual funds that are starting to offer these mixture of private markets and public markets and uh, commodities, etc. Thank you, Jerry. I mean, you were mentioning earlier as well in the UK, I think you made quite a good point in that um, there, there are more proactive measures for investors to be their own chief investment officers, and, and they're upskilling themselves with that kind of know-how. I think. Um, a lot of people are panicking at this point. Um, they're looking at things to diversify into without really knowing much about these new asset classes. Um, what's your advice? Or what's your take on this? Uh, yeah, um, let, let's let's Can go you with like, you. Let, let yeah, YS. Y yes, yes. YS. Your turn, no, your uh, turn. From my from our point of view is uh, in view of these uh, market certainties. Well, the best for us uh, that we can do is to lower down our risk. Yeah. Um, if we have uh, been uh, investing heavily into some of these uh, equity funds, perhaps uh, it's also time for us to uh, relook into the investment strategies. Perhaps we can do, like I mentioned just now, some dollar cost averaging. All right. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, perhaps to also get uh, ourselves uh, move into other uh, safer investment uh, assets. Like, like what? Uh, Putting, putting some money into uh, mixed asset funds, for instance, yeah, where you have a more balanced portfolio, where you have about 60% exposure into the equity funds and about 40% bond, vice versa, and which is also a kind of fund that is uh, dynamically uh, managed by our fund managers. So in a way, uh, we will probably be able to reduce the risk at the same time. Well, um, on the other hand, is that uh, we also have uh, some bond funds that are also available uh, for the uh, public. And here, maybe we can uh, look into some of the uh, shorter term fund, uh, bond funds, which of uh, lesser volatility, yeah, um, that uh, probably it's more elastic uh, when it comes to uh, interest rate uh, movement and changes. That's my take on this. What do you think about asset classes that offer more liquidity? At this, I mean, like, what, where would you say liquidity is a factor in, in any of this in these times? Since you you mentioned that cash is cash will always be king in that way. Well, again, it depends on uh, uh, what type of client you have, uh, but uh, uh, I think liquidity for the first time in really since the global financial crisis back in two thousand seven, it started to shrink from the markets, and because we have inflation. The central banks can't do anything about it. You know, in the past, they've been able to provide that liquidity by uh, cutting interest rates, by doing quantitative easing, uh, by basically helicopter money, spraying money at people, particularly during the uh, COVID shutdown. You know, uh, the average American who couldn't work was getting paid sometimes more than he was earning when he could work. Uh, so that keeps things alive. But that's maybe what created inflation. So. Um, Liquidity is a factor uh, 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 for, for uh, global markets, and it looks like it's shrinking, and that is reflecting itself in equity markets, in bond markets. You know, the, the gilt market fell very heavily because the bits just disappeared. So you have to be very wary if you're investing in a unit trust that, let's say, is trading in private markets. Uh, and a lot of people in private equity, in private markets say, well, we have an illiquidity premium saying, you know, our prices are higher because it's not traded very often. But when things turn 180 degrees, it becomes an, an illiquidity discount. You know, so you have to be careful uh, uh, against uh, not getting stuck in something. That's a good point. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, all right. That, so 
We've only got 15 minutes left on the clock. There are some uh, questions. Lot of yes, yes. A lot of burning questions here, actually. There's one that's very popular. Um, it's by Asha. He asks, how would investment in precious metals and renewable energy, so you did touch upon um, precious metals earlier, um, what do you think, it, would that help in, in diversing portfolios? Do you think it's a good time? Do you think it's too volatile? Uh, and, and, and that's precious metals. What about renewable energy? Um, thoughts uh, from anyone on the panel? I Dr. Think, Tan, go ahead. Uh, okay, I think renewable energy is a growth sector, and I think uh, because of ESG and all these things, people will go for it, but let me explain this way. If you go into a growth sector and that growth sector price is already too high, actually it's no use to you. You go and buy a bank at the highest price, it's also no use to you. That's why a fund manager will live forever if you know how to do it, you know. So we always emphasize on research, yeah? uh, experience and do a bit of diversification, yeah? which is what we are talking about today. Yeah, so at the moment, if you say which, I can see why, why S. Chong just now mentioned that they want to go to a safer area because you get hit so hard. Now the safer area is buy a very quality paper, very quality paper, short term. Not just short term. If that short term, the quality is not there, like Ambrose was saying, it's also very high risk, you know. But the key is that if you go into long term with a rising interest rate, you definitely will lose money. There's no way you're going to make money. So in one sense, why when I say keep cash, when I keep cash, I mean you go to quality short term. So that's one area you want. Now, in short, I would say this. This is what everybody wants. You want to take higher return, acceptable risk. How do you do this? Now, a good fund manager will know how to sense it. When they want to take lower risk, you go to shorter term of bonds, but also quality. No point buying a shorter term when there's lousy quality paper. You go to zero. It's no high, not lower risk. So uh, I think the aim, the aim is that you want higher return with acceptable risk. How do you do that? A good fund manager must be able to do that. If you cannot do that, I think you're out of the job, for sure. Well, especially in these times. Um, <laughs> yes, um, uh, did you want to say, uh, add to that, Jerry? Well, yeah, I think that uh, uh, renewable energy and overall sustainability, uh, it's, it's become, it's absolutely vital now, and we've invested a lot, uh, and uh, uh, tools, as well as training uh, all our fund managers, every portfolio management team uh, has got an ESG specialists in it yeah. now, uh, and we're not doing it just because uh, uh, we, we want to be sort of seen as tree hugging and, and green, but the reality is companies, some companies do not take into account the way the world is changing. And I think uh, ever since the 90s when, uh, uh, I think his name was Ranulph Fiennes, went up to the, 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 the South Pole and uh, he was seeing the ice retreating, there's no doubt that uh, the climate is changing. I think even Jeremy Clarkson and uh, Donald Trump will uh, 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 grudgingly admit that things are changing. Uh, and if a company doesn't take into account how things are going to change, and you're, say, purely concentrating on coal mining, and you're not anticipating any transition from that business, you are in risk of uh, uh, the worst sin for fund managers, and that is to have an investment that goes to zero. Uh, having said that, I think the world has got to look at renewable energy more, but right now, uh, uh, with the problems going on with the Ukraine war, etc., uh, that uh, Europe in particular is not geared to run solely by renewable energy. You have to have some uh, fossil fuel. So I think in the long term, we have to go down that road. In the near term, uh, uh, maybe there's been a bit of a pushback against uh, you know, tree hugging and the, the green investment theme. Uh, well, we, mainly we, because of the oil crisis as well. Yeah. I mean, you, you, with the people have seen that. And so interestingly enough, traditional sectors like that have seen a boost. <laughs> they um, have, yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, there are a number of companies in the energy sector in the first half of the year was about the only sector of the equity market that performed quite well. And a lot of them were pure fossil fuels. You know, Shell's made more money in the first half of the year than they've ever made before. But I don't know whether longer term, 
that can repeat itself. In fact, I think even the CEO of Shell is saying, we won't be able to do this again in a hurry. Even the CEO of Petronas is saying, we can't keep uh, producing these profits. And, and to add to that point, I think also not to forget that regulatory bodies are also encouraging um, uh, a push towards ESG. So, so I guess there's, there's still going to be a future there. Um, there's a question about uh, currency overlay. What do you think of that as a diversification strategy? Who would like to take that? Well, I've, I've got another slide, if I can get those slides up, actually. Uh, it's slide number four that looks at all these different um, uh, strategies that uh, exist. Again, it's really hard to read, but each different color is a different strategy, like private equity, macro investing, uh, uh, quantitative, event-driven, uh, a market neutral, etc. Uh, and one of them is a currency overlay. Um, and it has performed extremely well in the past. Uh, what's the top performer there actually is venture capital. But if you look at uh, the past couple of years, or in fact the past year, venture capital has performed the worst. Uh, and again, the, the, the white boxes there are a mix of all these strategies. Uh, they tend to be you know, outperforming an index and performing pretty well, certainly giving you a return better than uh, your fixed deposit. So, uh, I, it's very hard to forecast a currency overlay. You know, if you went 100% into US dollars at the beginning of this year, you are literally, you know, I was going to say quids in, but quids is a pound sterling, and that, that's not a thing to have. But I don't know when it's going to end, but I wouldn't, uh, uh, and maybe Dr. Tan might differ from yeah. me, but uh, uh, you wouldn't have all your money in uh, US dollars, would you? you? You might even not have all your money in Sing dollars. I think currency is now so liquid that is oh sorry can you hear me yeah it's almost that like you could, it's a class by itself you know you can invest in various currency uh, of course if you specialize in it you may also make good money uh, unfortunately i we don't specialize but we do pay attention because some of our funds are us dollars some of our funds are ringgit you know yeah uh, if you see a trend if, of uh, uh uh, US dollar strengthening over the longer term, you might adjust your Malaysian portfolio to those companies that have costs in ringgit and revenues in US dollars, etc. Good point, yeah. I, I, okay, maybe I should comment at this time because you, you notice that I like to think that US dollars is overvalued. US dollars uh, uh, has been so strong, but I think US government definitely interested to maintain the US dollar strength because this is one of the few times that uh, it's very different than normal. Uh, U.S. dollars is so strong, and yet their inflation was so high. And this is not great, not great, in the sense that uh, if they don't continue to increase their interest rate, U.S. dollars will be weakened. When U.S. dollars weaken, the inflation will go up higher. And I think the ruling party will be gone. So they'll be so interested to increase the interest rate. But that will create another problem later on because your economy will slow down, plus already have enough disruption. So we are actually in a very uh, worrisome period, if you can see, because U.S. is the most influential market, and yet U.S. is, is uh, very still not, not low. Like I said, your present level is higher than the highest point in 2020 you still have to be careful. Uh, maybe before you finish this off, I would like to mention this. We are definitely very careful. We are definitely very selective. You, you also notice that not all share will drop to the lowest point at the same time. This is what we are hoping for. So hoping for that we buy an end value stock at a very low price and my share will recover earlier than others. That's the best strategy I can have. Thank you. Thank you. And YS, very quickly, what are your thoughts on currency overlay uh, as a diversification strategy? Um, from our perspective, um, if you haven't got any form of uh, currency exposure, um, perhaps uh, it's also good that uh, we look into some of these uh, available funds of ours, especially those uh, uh, funds that actually focus on uh, single currencies and also on diversified currencies. So perhaps this will be a, so another way of strategies that uh, our customers or investors can do in order for them to uh, diversify their portfolio. Um, that's so 
uh, part of this uh, hedging uh, process or strategies that Strategy. one can adopt. Right. Yep. Um, touching on your point earlier, actually, Dr. Tan, uh, there was a question earlier. If we can bring it back on Slido, please, on the Triffin uh, crisis. Um, uh, question about um, the U.S. dollar and when to switch to gold. You know, you're talking about how the USD is 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 overpriced, um, so overvalued. Uh, can you a expand very good, on that? A very good question. Uh, looking for you to ask that question, as we have done some research. You notice that gold has done very well between 2008 to 2011. Since 2011, gold has been volatile and gold has not really performed that well unless you were buying at the lower end and then goes up a bit. At the moment, if US keep on increasing their interest rate, people will still keep on holding US dollars. They are not going to go to gold because gold don't pay interest rate. And go also get a headache, you know. You also have to, to also keep on monitoring it. Now, if you see US dollars start weakening, and I think gold will go up, because gold is now also one of the reserve currency. So uh, this is what I, I can, see, can talk about. Gold don't pay interest rate. If US dollars keep on increasing interest rate, gold will be outshined by the US dollars. Thank you. I may be wrong, but, you know, that's the view I have. <laughs> no, these are very interesting perspectives. We're going to wrap up now. And um, as, as, a final, as a final word, um, I in light of all the discussions that we've had today, um, what's the best way? So let's wrap it up with what you think, not just now, because now is obviously volatile times, but how would you consider um, um, having a solid and structured portfolio beyond diversification? Okay, well, um, can I go back to my slides again? I've Please, just got one sure. slide right at the end that not everybody will agree with, but um, uh, it's a philosophy of a, a friend of mine who runs a, a, another fund investing regionally. Uh, he's got five rules of investing that I think, in simple terms, are, are, are very wise. Do not confuse economics with investing. We don't know how the economies are going to work out. Do not confuse politics with investing. Do not confuse markets with investing. Do not confuse liquidity with investing, but investing is about owning profitable, cash-generating, growing business whose honest management sticks to its core competency and pays out every unneeded cent as dividend and doesn't look into trying to manipulate its share price. Now, this is a rather long answer, but I think those are five pretty good rules that people confuse investing with, you know, looking at the political situation, looking at macro, looking at all these things. Of course, they're a factor, but the quality of the company and its moats and its long-term growth are easier to, to, to measure. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, last words, uh, YS? Uh, from our <coughs> perspective is that uh, always remember that we ought to look into our portfolios from time to time. Uh, so there are a few areas that uh, we need to uh, pay special attention when especially there is a change in personal circumstances, such as your marital status, health, or even personal goals. Yeah. So that will warrant us to do necessary adjustments to our portfolio. And um, bear in mind that uh, our risk uh, appetite changes according to times. It's never uh, constant. So whatever is constant today is change. So in that sense, uh, we ought to uh, do a proper review of our portfolio. Um, from my perspective is that uh, when it comes to uh, portfolio uh, monitoring, it's very much uh, of an art or uh, more than a science. So with all these uh, factors that I mentioned just now and the processes that put in place, I think uh, that's a very important uh, skill or you need to have yeah, in order to uh, review and uh, restructure or rebalance your portfolio. And uh, always remember that uh, look at your portfolio periodically, yeah, uh, maybe on a biannual or annual basis. All right, make sure that you are still on track uh, with your investment objective in mind and the risk that you are undertaking is manageable. 
Thank you. Thank you, Wires. I think everyone is definitely looking at their portfolios right now and seeing how to rebalance it. It's, it's timely. Dr. Tan. Okay, let me make my last statement. I like to say that no investment guideline will work all the times, but some investment guideline will work most of the time. We are equity specialists. We have very good long-term track record, and we will focus, continue to focus our research, our experience, our wisdom in equity. And I believe the equity from this downturn level will do well in the long run. That's, thank you. And that answers the question, which asset class should we focus on? <laughs> we will in this focus time? on equity. <laughs> okay, yeah, yes. That's, that's, that's the, the best, <laughs> we, we have done the best we can. Yeah. And indeed, uh, yes, uh, choose your fund managers wisely as well. Uh, yes. I think that's the other key takeaway. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a very interesting session. Yes, Jerry, last word. No, I'm just going to say thank you, Anita. It's been uh, real fun. <laughs> thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been lovely. Uh, YS, hopefully you'll be able to join us in person next time. Um, yeah, thank you. All right.